we had one kid who, who, who bought the pack. He got the Charizard out. And then his mom brought him back the next day and said, Hey, I need my money back for this. Cause my son, what my son stole $10 from me. Here are the cards. And she put this Charizard down in front of us. And I was like, you gotta be kidding me. You want your money back? And she said, yes, he shouldn't have stolen it from me. And I looked at this kid and I could just tell exactly what happened. And I said, well, this kid's got to learn a great lesson here. So I handed her her 10 bucks back. And she's like, thank you for doing that. And I was like, yeah, no problem. We took it, we put it aside. We waited for a Charizard to get pulled again. And then we put this other one in there because we were able to sell. And I, I think we ended up selling something like 400 of these little bags and we got rid of all of our stuff. And I remember my boss looked at me like, he was like, that was the smartest thing we ever did. And it was because Charizard. It's always been Charizard. So welcome to another episode of The Hobby. Today, I'm very glad to be joined by the one and only Peta Party from Instagram, well-known collector of both Yu-Gi-Oh! and Pokemon cards. And today we are talking about Pokemon cards. If you haven't been following, we've been doing something called the Iconic 100 here at PWCC, counting down the 100 most iconic cards across the whole hobby as voted on by 150 experts. But one thing that we've realized is we just don't have enough Pokemon on this list. And so I asked Peter uh, to, to jump on here with us. Peter, thank you so much for jumping on. How are you doing today? I'm doing fine, Adam. How are you making out? Awesome. We're, I'm doing great. I'm excited to, to do this to do this episode with you. So the thing that I asked you to do is I said, can you compile a list, a ranked list of the 10 most iconic Pokemon cards in the whole of the hobby? And and I think you went out and, and used uh, <laughs> basi basically used the community to help you do this. Can you describe first before we get into the iconic? 10 most Pokemon cards, uh, most iconic Pokemon cards. Can you describe how you like went through this process? Yeah, well, there's essentially a forum that's been active now for the last decade, decade and a half, where the vast majority of a lot of the, I'll call it more hardcore Pokemon collectors like to congregate and discuss things. So I essentially went to the forum, which is called Elite Four, um and just asked everyone hey what do you guys and gals think about this you know where do you think a few cards i threw out fall on the pecking order can you make some more recommendations i was planning on putting a couple cards here i thought might ruffle some feathers and then i was completely blown away by the response on some of the people who were like completely in sync with where my headspace was at so that was kind of funny to hear to be honest awesome so are you saying that like you went into this thinking that you kind of knew what the top 10 would be and that some people's responses like made you think that the cards should be higher. Some cards should be higher. Yeah. Some cards should be lower. Is that right? Yeah. And there's a few cards that I wasn't planning on including at all, even though I would have put them on the list, but if that many people gave their feedback were like, no, like I really think like this is the best card for the list because of X, Y, and Z. I was like, well, as long as I'm not the only one crazy enough. To do <laughs> I've had that feeling before too, where you're like, in fact, this has happened with the iconic 100. There's a couple cards on it that I love a couple of them that I have. And I'm like, yeah. I don't even know how these are going to do. And then you see the votes come in and you go, <laughs> Oh, it's not just me. And so, okay. So let's jump right into the list. Um, actually first, are there any honorable mentions that you want to sort of you want to mention before we get into the top 10? Yeah, I'll, I'll throw in a couple of honorable mentions and a couple of caveats as well. Because realistically speaking with Pokemon in particular, you know, Charizard is essentially the Michael Jordan of Pokemon, as a lot of people like to call him. <laughs> um, so if I'd have left everyone up to their devices, half the list would just be Charizard. <laughs> <laughs> same thing with base set like base set is so nostalgic for so many people because that's what they grew up with as kids so a lot of people's default when they think about pokemon cards as a whole automatically gravitates to the earlier stuff from base set and the iconic stuff like your blastoise and your venus store and things like that so i didn't want to have half the list be base set cards or, and the other half be Charizards. 
So we essentially limited the list to two Charizards and we limited the list to two basic cards to try and add a bit of flavor to the mix, we'll say. So it wasn't just a, okay, yeah, Venusaur is going to be number five, Blastoise is going to be number three and, you know, add a bit of variety to the mix. So I, I totally, I totally understand this. Um, and I get this sentiment because when we were putting together the initial ballot for the iconic 100, we had like, I think it was like 12 or 13 Jordans. And we kept having people say, Oh, you need to put this Jordan on there. And you need to put that. Jordan on. Yeah. And I was like, all of a sudden we're going to have 60 Jordans on this ballot. We only have 200. Spots. This doesn't work. So it's the same thing I think you're saying with Charizard. And it's the same thing with that original set. I think it's from 1999, right? Like yeah. those two sets, you, you limited it to each. I like the framework that you've put around it. Okay. Tell us, tell us what the, the honorable mentions are. Listen, uh, you've obviously going to have your three main starter Pokemon for anyone who played Pokemon Red and Blue back in the day on Game Boy. Uh, so you started with your Bulbasaur, Charmander, and Squirtle, and their final evolutions end up being your Blastoise, your Venusaur, and your Charizard. So for two of the honorable mentions, we left Venusaur and Blasto Blastoise in honorable mention, I do believe that they, I know, uh, would be in the top five on a normal list if we were just having like a popularity poll. Got it. And just saying, hey, everyone pick your five favorite Pokemon cards. Um, but there's a running joke where people would rank, you know, when you're picking your starter Pokemon when you're playing the game back in the day, 70% would pick. Charmander first, it's like 20, 25% would pick Squirtle first. And it'd be like, oh, well, who would you pick for your second starter? It's like <laughs> 30, 40% would pick Squirtle and then 50% would pick a second Charmander. <laughs> <laughs> so the Venus store doesn't, doesn't get the love out of those three is what you're saying. No, <laughs> no. And unfortunately as much as I'd like to have Venusaur on the list. And I, I, if it was me and just leaving up to a popularity poll and not having any caveats on the list, I'd say Venusaur would probably be around number seven or eight on the list, just because it's so iconic. Uh, the fact that it was a starter evolution and so many people actually do enjoy the original artwork from like the big three, quote unquote, especially. Uh, same thing with Blastoise. And like I said, I wanted to limit it to two base set cards. So you could really argue for which base set cards should be included out of those two. And on a normal day, Blastoise would probably be number five or number six on the list. But if we're going to limit it to just the two base set cards, then you really can't include Blastoise on the list, in my opinion. Got you. Well, let's... Let's get to the top 10. I'll just say first, I looked, I just looked up how Venusaur, because, because, you know, we've just blasted <laughs> Venusaur here a little bit. Um, I looked at how he did on the original iconic 100 list, because he was, the, the Venusaur was on the original ballot. And out, yeah. of two, and out of 215 cards that were on the ballot, Venusaur finished a very respectable 165th. So, he's oh, that's not, actually pretty good. Not on the top 100. And, there are not too many Pokemon cards that made the, 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 the list. I'm not going to say how many at this point, but like I said, it's, it's too few in my opinion. And, and this is Pokemon's not just like, like just one of these other sort of gaming sets. Like no, it, is, it has its own following in a way that like, it really stands alone. Right. If I, if I think back at my time working at house of cards in Salt Lake city, when I was a kid, for seven years, there was only one time during that whole seven years we ever deviated from sports cards at all, at all, and that was during the, the initial year of Pokemon's run in the United States. <laughs> yep, where everything was just blown out the doors. Like we just sold it so fast, and so yeah, uh, it does have. They its shut own. down a lot of the printers for sports cards back for that year too, just to print more Pokemon cards too. They had to because it was that <laughs> popular. So with that said. Who did you and the community over on the forum, tell me the name of the forum again. Uh, Elite Four. On the Elite Forum, who did you determine was, was the number, what did you determine was the number 10 most iconic Pokemon card of all time? So this one might ruffle a bit of feathers 
specifically because it's a uh, modern card and modern Pokemon is evil and all that stuff. But when you think about modern cards that really drew people back into the hobby and like attracted a bunch of media buzz and headlines and stuff like that, you could argue that Evolution's Charizard from back in 2016 when the 20th, when the 20th anniversary was on the go for Pokemon, that did draw a lot of people back to the hobby, but that was just a reprint of the base set Charizard. Mm. It's like, okay, yeah. we'll give him more power. He does 200 attack instead of 100. He's got a bit more health, but it was essentially a one-to-one -one reprint for all intents and purposes. Um, the Hidden Fates Shiny Charizard GX that was released a few years ago, that was also technically a reprint, but the original hyper rare and full art version of that set back when it came out in Burning Shadows a couple years beforehand didn't have anywhere near the hysteria behind this card. Like you had people going to Walmart and getting into fist fights over trying to get boxes of Hidden Fates off the shelves to try and pull this card. And you only had like a one in 400 booster pack chance of pulling the thing, which made it hard enough to pull it. The scarcity of not being able to get it off the shelves is another thing. And then right out of the gate, you had a Beckett Black Label get graded the first week the set came out and mm -hmm. sold on auction for $10,000, which blew the record for a modern Pokemon card out of the water completely. You know, IGN was running headlines on it. CNN picked it up at one point, I think. You know, all these media outlets were talking about, look at this brand new Pokemon card that just sold for $10,000, which at the time was a lot of money for a Pokemon card mm. and a ridiculous amount of money for a modern Pokemon card. So I think it really deserves to be on the list and I wasn't the only one who thought that as well. Say the name of it one more time. The Hidden Fates. Hidden it's Fates. a shiny Charizard GX. But it's not Lots a of... it's not a reprint of the of the original. It's got a different no, no, no. Image. and it's and it's Yeah, so it's a di there's a different image on it. So it's a reprint with a different version from an earlier set. Basically, they took a bunch of older artworks they did and made them shiny and flashier mm. and made them way harder to pull. Got so it. like I said, it was like one in 400 pack chance of pulling this thing. There was no normal booster boxes. So you had to buy all these specialty boxes like a pin box or uh, just random gift set or something like that. And each one of those would only have like three to five packs in it. How so, often? Like, how often do you see this card up for sale these days? Is it pretty pretty tough card to find still? No, it's the set's been reprinted that many times now. It's pretty easy to actually get your hands on, but it still commands a premium over a lot of the other more modern cards that have come out in the last, you know, four or five years. Mm. And even the black labels, they bottomed out. It was around a thousand fifteen hundred dollars for the black labels, and then they came back around there a few months or a year ago and they're not doing 10 grand again because i think there's like three or four hundred of them at this point <laughs> but like it really set the standard for what modern pokemon would end up becoming and it was right before the whole 2020 lockdown pokemon boom when pokemon actually like went to the stratosphere so it actually drew a lot of those eyeballs back to the hobby before everyone got locked down. And like I said, there's people getting in fist fights at Walmart trying to get boxes of this stuff. I like, like it. Yeah, like it. it was just let's, fun. Let's jump now to number nine on, on the list. What did you guys come up with at number nine? Yeah, so we've got the Neo Revelation Shining Gyarados. So for anyone who played the original uh, Gold and Silver games on Game Boy Color back in the day, they were actually the number one selling game for two years in a row because of how well those games sold. Hmm. It, and it came out just before Christmas one year and then just kept selling and selling and selling. So arguably gold and silver is the best slash most popular Pokemon game to be released. And that is the game that introduced the concept of what are called shiny Pokemon. So basically you just hop into the tall grass and you get greeted by all these like explosion of sparkles that would just come out of nowhere. And 
the sprites of the Pokemon would have completely unique and different colorations to them. Mm. So a lot of people thought it was a glitch and would like turn off their Game Boy, not knowing what was going on, turn it back on. Okay, the colors back to normal. What it was, Game Freak actually inserted these like special chase Pokemon. You had a one in like 4,000 chance of encountering and just add a bit of, you know, like mystery and competitive like catching for people to, who played a lot of the game to have something post game to go and look for. So the only Pokemon you were actually guaranteed to get that was shiny was a Gyarados that you pick up through one of the quests in between gyms fighting team rocket and the Neo revelation Gyarados that we're talking about here is actually the p- depiction of you being out in like this little boat dingy thing in the middle of this lake with this raging storm going on, trying to catch this giant like sea serpent. And the artwork is of the shine, like the red shiny version. So it really, this set and this card in particular, because this is the first shiny Pokemon card that they introduced, has a very special place in a lot of people's hearts because it's the only guaranteed shiny Pokemon you can actually catch in the game for like, it was like 10, 12 years after that point before they brought out another guaranteed shiny Pokemon. So for a lot of people who didn't have the wherewithal to go out and try to catch 4,000 of the same Pokemon over and over again, like this is your only shot at getting the shiny. So the fact that it had a textured, like bumpy feel to the card, it had the shiny artwork taken directly from the game made you feel like you were being sucked into the game itself. And a lot of people really like that artwork and a lot of people really like that card as a result. You know, when I think about um, this card, one of the things that I think about as you're describing it is how important firsts are in the world of collecting. People love firsts. People yeah. love rookies. I also think about Pokemon Go because when Pokemon Go uh, brought <laughs> out the, the shiny Pokemon, that was yeah. something that changed the game and kept it pep, kept it popular for for. A, for a time amongst a lot of the players of it. So I think that connection is kind of interesting. Let's move to number eight uh, yep. quickly. What do you have as the number eight on the list? I'm probably going to get a bit of slack for not having this higher on the list, but surprisingly, a lot of people didn't vote it on their list. So we've got the Trophy Kangaskhan mm. card from the original 1998 Japanese parent child tournament. So essentially, the only way to get this card is to enter this parent-child tournament where they'd pair a mother or father with their children and they'd make them like co-battle in a tournament against other parents and child and basically let them slug it out for the day and the winners of the tournament would get copies of this card and they had thousands of people show up to this tournament and there's only, depending on who you talk to, about 100 copies of this card floating around. Uh, it's always so about it's, rarity, right? In every, in every world of collecting, that thing that is rare, that's hard to find for the completionists, that is what lends itself to value. And this is where yeah. you, know, you see some of the comparables between Pokemon and basketball and baseball and all sorts of different types of collectibles. Rarity matters, and uh, I think that's interesting. Keep talking about it. I, I interrupt. Yeah, so, and, and it has a really nice story to it because it's this parent-child tournament where they had to play together to try and win this card. Yeah. And for anyone who doesn't know the character design behind Kangaskhan, it's essentially like a kangaroo. So you've got the mommy Kangaskhan with the baby Kangaskhan in her little pouch, and it's just this adorable depiction of it and it just gives you these warm, fuzzy feelings just looking at the card. I love it. I also want to point out real quick, you said at the beginning that you'd catch some flack for it. Just know this, <laughs> as we're counting down the Iconic 100 now, almost every card so far, people have been like, this is way too low. Well, guess what? They can't all be way too low, okay? They can't all be way too low. Okay, number seven. What do you got at number seven? Yeah. Um, we've got the EX Deoxys Rayquaza Gold Star. So My son's talked to me about this card before. I haven't seen it, but I, I know it, I know it exists. This is the holy grail when it comes to gold star Pokemon cards. So basically, gold stars were this elusive chase card. You can only get one in every two boxes for this limited run of 
two or three years that they were actually inserting them in the boxes. And some sets would have two, three, or four gold stars in them. So if you wanted to get a particular Pokemon and get that particular Pokemon's gold star, you might have to open a case or two cases of booster boxes just to try and pull this one card. Got it. And this was in like the bottom of the popularity when it came to Pokemon. So a lot of these sets were super short printed. So if you're trying to pull an extremely hard to get set card and there's limited supply available to even try and pull the thing from, you've got a recipe for, I wouldn't say disaster because it's a good thing because it makes this card as coveted as it is because of the scarcity and the artwork on it is just absolutely jaw dropping. In my opinion, it's one of the best designed Pokemon cards that they've actually ever produced. So you've got this, you know, intrinsic chase behind the card and the scarcity behind it, making it even harder to get the thing. And it's an extremely low pop report too, because of a few manufacturer issues. So if you're trying to get, you know, a mint or gem mint card, you're even going to have a tougher time again. So I think it really deserves to be on this list. If for no other reason than the artwork on it, it's, it's, my favorite gold star artwork and in my top 10 of all my favorite artworks of all time to be honest how many copies do you know do you have any information on how many copies have been graded or how many copies there are out in the wild the psa 10 pop is somewhere around 40 i believe um there's not a whole lot graded like most of these gold stars outside of one that got backdoored through a factory there's only a few hundred copies graded by psa or beckett I love and it. yeah it's just a really nice card. It's really hard to get your hands on. So I think it deserves a spot on the list. Let's go to number six. And number six is why we don't have Blastoise or Venusaur on the list. So we've got the Red Cheeks Pikachu, illustrated by Mitsuhiro Rita. This card is what people think of when they think of Pikachu, for the most part. Like, you've got anyone who grew up back in the 90s like me when you think about pikachu that's your default that's what your headspace goes to you've got the little quote-unquote chonkachu everyone likes calling them with little chubby cheeks and before uh all the newer cutesy depictions really started taking hold this is more of a realistic like just a mouse out in the wild type of thing um some people may know there's two different versions of this card you've got the yellow cheeks version and you've got the Red Cheeks version. So the Red Cheeks version was the nicer, harder to get version, we'll call it, that was only in the original first edition booster boxes and shadowless booster boxes that are just first edition cards without the first edition stamp. So you can't get this in Unlimited. Mm. So if you're looking for a Pikachu card, that's not gonna cost you, you know, like $5 million. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> this is the card that people want. This is the card people grew up with. And I honestly think it's like Pokemon at its simplest, but at its best. You just got Pikachu just chilling out in a forest, just minding its own business. And I just like the simplicity behind the artwork. And that's just my default when it comes to Pikachu. I just think of that card automatically. When I think again about the iconic 100 list that we did, we put almost all of the cards that you've got here on your list. Almost all of them were were in our our ballot, um, and in this, and we we had the original Pikachu card on the list as well. Um, I like the foreshadowing you did, by the way, unquote the five million dollar Pikachu. I, that, that wasn't lost on me. For, for people who keep, who keep listening, to it, understand here what I'm what I'm talking about in a moment. But the question that I had about this one is. You know, you mentioned that uh, this is the red cheeks Pikachu and there's another one that's yellow cheeks. Do you think that the manufacturers knew what they were doing? Was that intentional or was this just, or was this just a thing that happened? Depending on who you talk to, um, Arita did the original version of the card and the Wizards of the Coast changed it and he didn't like that too much. (laughs) So they had to change it back to the original version. Um, I don't know the specifics behind it, but it 
I wouldn't be surprised if that were the case. <laughs> Something where just some executive was like, hey, I like this version better. Let's go with this one type of thing. Well, we talked about, um, you're familiar with the Billy Ripken 1989 Fleer card that has the the you, the, the swear word on the on the, the, the <laughs> knob of the bat. This sort of thing, what it what it what it lent itself to was was several different versions that came out afterwards. And that's what can happen in printing. And so yeah. the fact that there's two and there's this, there was a disagreement or something, it's just not shocking. That's that's typically how these things go. But that's that's yeah. uh, the first base set card from 1999 that we hit. But then we come to number five. So what do you have as the number five card <laughs> on, on the list? Um, I was honestly surprised by how many people had this card included in their list, just because when you think about expensive or like flashy Pokemon cards, this doesn't really come to mind. But when you think about Pokemon cards as a whole, and you know, these iconic cards that everyone knows about, literally everyone owned a base set Machamp. So the difference between the Japanese and the English releases of Pokemon in the Japanese starter decks that you get when you were like trying to make your decks and all that, and you weren't just buying booster packs, you could get any holographic card. You could get your Charizard, you could get Blastoise, you could get Venusaur, Machamp, you could get Mewtwo, you could get anything. But in English, they said, nah, we don't want to do that. We're going to leave that to the booster boxes only. And we're going to put Machamp for some reason, specifically in all the starter decks. So the card was just printed into Oblivion, but everyone owned a copy of that card. It didn't matter who you were or what Pokemon you liked. If your aunt found out you were into Pokemon, oh, I'll just buy little Timmy a uh, starter deck. <laughs> and now he has 18 Machamps because all of her other aunts and uncles suck the same thing. <laughs> were, were, there, were there a disproportionate number of first edition ones because I'll, I've seen I, I actually bought some kids some cards for my kids the other a couple of years ago and I got a first edition of this one and I thought oh it's going to be huge money and then it, it wasn't <laughs> huge money and I thought it seems like there's a lot of first editions in this card yeah so the difference with Machamp is all of them are first edition for some reason ah. <laughs> I don't accident? know I have no idea but like literally every copy of Machamp I've ever seen is a first edition copy um, the actual first edition version of Machamp is the shadowless version. So it's got oh. a slightly like lighter color tone to the entire card. And there's no like dark border on the right hand side of the card. So that would be your true like first edition printing of that card. That thing is near impossible to find, especially if you're trying to get like a gem mint PSA 10 copy or something like that. Those are extremely <laughs> difficult to find. Just the inherent utility behind the starter decks was to help you make decks with. So everyone just played with all the cards. Like Machamp was like the Mickey Mantle back in the day where people were throwing it in their bicycle spokes, trying to make it, to me. make it sound whoop, 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 when you're driving by. So like to have the original like shadowless version of that card in really good condition is near impossible to actually find. Interesting. I love it. So let's move to the final four then. At number yeah, four. The lead four. <laughs> on number four on the Peta Party all-time iconic Pokemon list, we have the Neo Genesis Lugia. So like I mentioned earlier, gold and silver are arguably the best and most popular Pokemon games ever produced. Um, the mascot really for that game was Lugia. So okay. you had on the cover for silver, you had Lugia on the cover for gold, you had Ho. But a vast majority of people really liked Lugia more than Ho. No different than most people liked Charizard more than Blastoise. Mm. So the main difference here is Lugia was a legendary Pokemon that you couldn't get till it was like the end of the game. So it was one of those things where you had to go like in this deep dark dungeon to try and track it down yep. and then after slogging through this dungeon and limping to the cave lugia is in you still have to beat lugia without killing it and trying to catch the thing. <laughs> and 
this was the first release of the gold and silver Pokemon cards. So Lugia is featured prominently on the box art of the box itself. And you've got on one of the booster packs and everyone just likes this card. Like, I don't know anyone who is a fan of gold and silver who doesn't like this Lugia card. Hmm. And the big thing with this one and a lot of the other gold and silver cards to be released later, this card is impossible to grade. There's only like 42 or 43 PSA 10 copies at this point oh, nice. because the centering is atrocious on a lot of them or, and, or I should say, you've got all these factory print lines that all these normal type Pokemon cards are notorious for, like your Chain Seeing Clefairy and things like that. And it's just impossible to find a nice copy of the thing, even though this set was just printed and printed and printed because of the popularity behind it. The manufacturer defects with it and the fact that people loved it so much meant the thing got played into oblivion, <laughs> essentially. So it's just one of those iconic Pokemon that a lot of people like and have really nice memories of their childhood catching it in the video game. And it's just one of those cards that when you think of like gold and silver era Pokemon, this is what you automatically default to. Reminds me of like a card in, in, in basketball in the 1980s, the 1980 tops uh, card with magic uh, bird and Irving. It's not a rare, card. <laughs> yeah. not a yeah. rare card at all, but to find one in a perfect, in perfect shape because of the centering, because of the printing issues is next to impossible. And so what yep. I like about that is, you know, you, if you want to pick up a copy, it's probably not the most expensive thing in the world. I mean, it's still probably not cheap, but you can, you can probably find one. Yeah, but if it's you attainable. Really want, yeah, but to find one of the best ones, next impossible. So, Agreed okay, let's go to number three. I'm, I'm excited for number three because I, I want you to, um, to educate us about this. <laughs> Tell us what number three is and why it's as high on the list as it is. So number three is going to be our Pikachu Illustrator. Um, for the people who don't know what the illustrator is, because you haven't been watching WrestleMania, um, <laughs> it's essentially this <laughs> art competition card from early 1998. There's only 23 confirmed official copies awarded. Wow. So that's pretty amazing. Yeah. Not just not just high grade. There's only 23 copies of the card or examples. Yeah. Of the card. Okay. yeah. After this initial awarding, there is another 16 awarded. But even then, you're still only looking at 39 copies of this card that are known to exist. Yeah. And out of those 39 copies, like this was released back in 1998. So you're talking 25 years ago. And people didn't think Pokemon was going to turn into the juggernaut it no is today. No one exactly. And this is before the English release of all the Pokemon cards. This is early 1998. This is January. So this is even before any of the international hype started with Pokemon. So imagine yourself now if you won an art competition for some brand new trading card game for a video game that is kind of popular, but, you know, it's not this giant multimedia franchise it is today. A lot of people would treasure that, but how many people are going to take real good care of that? Especially if the franchise is quote unquote in the kids playing video games. Yep. How many of those winners were not adults? They were younger kids who entered the competition, who drew their Pokemon card, won the illustrator, and then didn't take care of it or threw it in a closet and forgot that they had it. And whoops, mom threw up my Pokemon collection and now that card doesn't exist anymore. Yep. It's gone. It's thrown away. And yeah. it makes sense because it's a piece of cardboard that, especially at that time, nobody knew what Pokemon would become. No, I think no one that knew that this, that, you know, in 2021, an illustrator was going to go for $5 million. $5 million. So the thing that, that I think is, is interesting to recognize here too is when you first see the Pikachu, Pikachu Illustrator card, it appears to be something that would have come out of the original 1999 packs. 
It's just through understanding the history of it, as you've just described, that you realize, oh, I could open every box that that ever made, and I would never pull the card. Um, exactly. So you 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 take one of the probably two most popular characters, if not the most popular character from the show, from the game, and you add to it rarity. <laughs> you add to it that it's really the first of that era, and that it has the same formatting around it the same design work is, is so much of that original 99 set that you talk about you add all that together and then add to add into it how rare it is and you have the perfect situation for the most expensive pokemon card in the world it, do you think it, it will just, always be the most expensive pokemon card in the world if a black label chair base set first edition charizard came around i could see that maybe teetering depending on how badly someone wanted to pay for that card but outside of that i don't think anything beats illustrator at this what, point what would you what would you rather own if it, if it existed <laughs> would you rather own uh, a black label charizard or a pikachu illustrator that's like in really good shape i go with the charizard okay like it, it's different for me because i grew up with charizard i didn't grow up with the illustrator so charizard has a special place in my heart <laughs> i like for me i'm a rare card collector who who collects cards based on the card not not as much the grade the grade to me is important but yeah. it's very much secondary so i yeah. love the as you just described the illustrator to me i'm like i'm gonna go find one i'm not actually <laughs> going to find it. but um I, i've held an illustrator before and it is quite honestly one of the most beautiful cards I've ever seen. Like the artwork behind it is just absolutely gorgeous. Like when you look at that and just shift it around in the light a bit, you just like, damn, I want to own one of these. <laughs> All right. Well, we're down to the final two. Give us number two, Peter. Probably I was expecting to get a lot of slack for having this on the list. And then almost everyone who I contacted had the ancient Mew movie promo card on their list. I was actually like blown away by how many people thought that this card was iconic as it is. I thought I was going to be an outlier and I was going to get you know, a lot of people jeering at me, but almost everyone agrees uh, with how iconic this card is. Why is it? Why is it so iconic? Because again, everyone had a copy. And it just looks cool. It's not your standard Pokemon card. It's got like these ancient hieroglyphics on it. It's got like this stone tablet etched illustration of Mew on it. It's just a cool looking, unique take on a Pokemon card. The whole thing front and back is holographic and has all these rainbow colors depending on what way you put it in the light it's it's just a cool looking card and everyone had exposure to it because everyone went to see the pokemon movies when they came out back in the day amazing i'll just say real quick about this one because we don't have a lot of time um yeah. when i worked at the card shop back for those six or seven years it was always charizard everybody always talked about charizard until close to the end of the popularity of, of pokemon where i heard kids saying no 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 the Mew, Mew's the one I want now. And so it felt to me like the, the kids of that era who were, you know, they were, they were eight, they were eight or they were six to eight years younger than I, than I was. Right. I, I kind of missed it. I was a little bit old to be collecting it at, you know, when it first came out, yeah. um, like those original kids, they had two cards um, at the top of, at, at the top of their list. And I think it's ironic that here we are right now going through this <laughs> list and you know, same two cards, spoiler alert, spoiler alert. <laughs> Um, the top two cards on this on this list, Peter, are those same two characters that have yep. sort of been at the head of Pokemon conversations really now for, you know, 23 years. And so um, take it away. Tell us about the most iconic card in the history of Pokemon and tell us why, <laughs> it is, why what, what the legend is behind it. The drum roll to no one's surprise at all is going to be base at Charizard. That card, by far and again, is not only the most well-known Pokemon card, it's the most desired card by kids when they were growing up, and it just looks cool. <laughs> like, when you have something, I, I have a test for anything I'm looking at buying. It's like, do I think it's cool, and do other th people think it looks cool, and does it look cool? 
then I probably want it. <laughs> and Charizard ticks that box. Um, you've got the literal poster boy for the original Pokemon Red game, right on a giant illustration Charizard. When you pick your starter Pokemon, the fire lizard turns into this big dinosaur dragon looking fire spewing behemoth that you could fly around on. And a lot of people, like I said before, chose Charmander as their first starter. You had like more between two thirds and three quarters of people pick Charmander first. So think about it this way. You've got all these kids and a lot of them may not have a lot of friends or don't have any friends. And they're starting this magical journey when they're picking up their Pokemon Red or Blue on Game Boy. And they meet this old dude in a lab. It's like, pick one of these three monsters and go make them fight other monsters. And you pick Charmander. And Charmander ends up becoming your best friend goes through you, you battle all the gym leaders you beat a mafia boss then you go beat the elite four and end up becoming the pokemon champion and charmander turns into charmeleon charmeleon turns into charizard so charizard is your best friend that goes on this unforgettable journey that made pokemon as special as it is it is for so many people and when the trading cards got released back in the day, this was really a way for your pixelated friends to come to life and have, you know, some vitality breathe into them. You can visualize, oh, man, like that's what Charizard actually looks like. This is so cool. So a lot of people wanted to own their best friend. Right. It's, it's as simple as that. Like, if you look at how nice a job that Arita did with that artwork you've got Charizard leaning in spewing a giant flame blast at you and it just looks cool so you've got a lot of kids who you know are in the say 8 to 15 range who just see this fire breathing dinosaur dragon thing that was their best friend going through arguably one of the best video games ever created yeah. Everyone wanted that card. Plus, he had 100 damage in his attack, which meant he could wipe the floor with pretty well any other Pokemon you were playing against. So it's the perfect storm of having a story behind it. You've got great artwork and the whole collectability behind Pokemon as a whole everyone wanted to catch them all quote unquote yep. but everyone wanted charizard if you had to pick a card you pick charizard because it was your friend it looked cool and he did a whole lot of damage <laughs> you know i think it's neat that charizard bookends this list that you've got him at 10 but you've got him at one um and like i say when i look back at my time working at the card shop everybody wanted a charizard at the very end of the of the pokemon um I don't want to call it bubble, but that that initial it, sort of it was. excitement around Pokemon. We had all these extra singles and we had, you know, all the energy cards and just a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> and so I went, my boss was like, what are we going to do to get rid of this stuff? And I, I said to him, well, everybody still wants Charizard. Let's create these grab bags. And so we took team bags with the fold over sticky side and we put yeah. in like five energies and five commons and you know, a couple of uncommons and a rare and one hall of foil card per pack. And we, so, and we put them all in there and we said, we're going to do, you know, it was like 20 something cards and we're going to charge $10 a piece for each of these. And in mm. this box at all times, there will always be at least one Charizard and kids who were basically done with the whole collect Pokemon thing. They were still scraping together their 10 bucks so they could buy <laughs> their little pack. And they'd come in. We had one kid who, who, who bought the pack. He got the Charizard out. And then his mom brought him back the next day and said, hey, 
I need my money back for this because my son, what my son stole ten dollars from me. Here are the cards, and she put this Charizard down in front of us, and I was like, "You gotta be kidding me!" You want your money back? And she said, "Yes, he shouldn't have stolen it from me." And I looked at this kid, and I could just tell exactly what happened. And I said, "Well, this kid's got to learn a great lesson here." So I handed her her ten bucks back, and she's like, "Thank you for doing that." And I was like, "Yeah, no problem." We took it, we put it aside. We waited for a Charizard to get pulled again, and then we put this other one in there because we were able to sell. And I, I think we ended up selling something like. 400 of these little bags and we got rid of all of our stuff and i remember my boss looked at me like he was like that was the smartest thing we ever did and it was because charizard it's always been charizard so peter i think that having charizard number one on this list is a no-brainer um i want to thank you for for taking the time to go through this list with us today i think that this has been a fantastic way to look at it and super educational i've learned a ton really want to thank you again is there any any other last thoughts you want to leave with the audience no, I just want to say thank you for having me on and talking about Pokemon for going through this whole countdown with me. And uh, I'm interested in to see any of the feedback we get on the list and who argues what should have been on the list, what shouldn't have been on, and who should have been higher or lower. Well, one thing we know for sure is that Pokemon card collectors <laughs> are willing to share how they feel about these things. <laughs> We'll see what we'll see what what you say in the comments. Please uh, like, comment, subscribe, say whatever you want to in the in the comments. Tell Peter he's crazy. Just know that it wasn't my fault. It wasn't my fault. Okay? <laughs> I got something wrong. It's on Peter. So um, thank you guys again for joining for this episode of the Hobby. Join us next week uh, again on Wednesday for our next episode. And until next time, happy collecting.